join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis Discussion brought to you by Forum IAS for the date 10th of March 2023. So for today we will be covering 5 topics uh, ranging from international relations, governance, economics and polity. So alongside this we will also be discussing 2 previous year prelims questions and also uh, mains practice questions. So with this straight away. Let us move to the first article for the day. IBSA can play vital role in reforming digital governance, says Diplo Foundation report. See, the Geneva-based Diplo Foundation has said that IBSA forum has a potential to play a key role in the process of reforming digital governance. See, the role of IBSA forum has gained prominence because digital Geopolitical tensions are showing no signs of easing. So, Diplo Foundation says that if at all there could be any sign of reforms in digital governance across the globe, it can, it can be brought to action only by this IBSA forum. So, the report also says that uh, a new gold standard for data could be promoted during India's G20 presidency. And the report predicts so because firstly, the IBSA countries are strong supporters of multilateralism and multi-stakeholder approaches. Secondly, the digitization is driving growth in these IBSA forum countries. So these countries would want to govern the digital space in the manner that would suit their culture, politics and economic climate. For example, if we take India, we have Aadhaar biometric ID system which is seen as a leading digital identity initiative by many countries. Although they get inspired by these digital technologies, countries would not adopt it until there is a global standards and recognition. Third thing alongside the digitization is the large population among the IBSA forum, where these large population is seen as, where the data of these large population is seen as a natural resource. So, the use of data has to be regulated in a manner that it does not affect the sovereignty and security of these countries. So, in this article, it is saying that only India as a leader can take efforts to bring in reforms in digital governance through the IBSA forum. So, in this context, let us know about the IBSA forum in detail. See, it is a unique forum that brings together India, Brazil and South Africa. Know that all these three countries are developing pluralistic, multicultural, multi-ethnic and multi-religious nations. The grouping was formalized and named as IBSA Dialogue Forum when the foreign ministers of these three countries met in Brasilia on the month of June 2003. And then later on they issued the declaration named Brasilia Declaration. So you have to know that Brasilia Declaration, Brasilia Declaration is associated with IBSA forum. See, the cooperation in IBSA is on three fronts. First, it acts as a forum uh, for consultation and coordination on global and regional political issues such as the reforms of uh, global institutions and economic governance, WTO agenda, climate change, terrorism, etc. Secondly, it undertakes trilateral collaboration on concrete areas or projects through 14 working groups and 6 people to people forum for a common benefit of 3 countries. Thirdly, this forum assists other developing countries by taking up projects through IBSA fund. Since we have come across this IBSA fund, let us know about this also. See, the IBSA which stands for India, Brazil and South Africa fund facility for poverty and hunger alleviation is a unique fund through which development projects are executed. Know that the said development projects are executed with IBSA, IBSA funding in fellow developing countries. Also know that the funds got established in the year 2004. 
third important fact is that the fund is managed by the un office for south south cooperation also know that each ibsa member country is required to contribute 1 million per annum to the fund now coming to the objective of this fund it helps the ibsa countries to alleviate poverty and hunger in nations of the south then it will also uh, help in developing best practices in the fight against poverty and hunger by facilitating project execution in interested countries of global south also the objective of this fund is to pioneer and lead by example the south south cooperation agenda then finally it helps build new partnership for development and from films point of view remember ibsa do not have any headquarter nor does it have any permanent executive secretariat at the highest level it counts on the summit of heads of the state and government and so far five ibsa leadership summits have been held and the fifth ibsc sub- summit was held in pretoria which is in south africa in the year 2011 and the sixth ibsa summit is to be hosted by india now if we take the joint naval exercise ibsa maritime exercise is an important part of ibsa trilateral defense Co- cooperation and know that six editions of ibsa mar have been held so far and the latest one uh, held on the coast of south africa in the year 2018 so these are the few points regarding the ibsa in this topic we saw about ibsa fund and also about the ibsa forum as a whole so with this let us close the, this topic and move to the second topic of the day coming to the second topic center to reconsider safe harbor clause in the it law see this news article highlights that the union government has planned to come up with an act titled new digital india act and uh, this act is said to be the broad overhaul of the it act of 2000 that is the union government has taken the flaws in the it act of 2000 into account and based on the needs of today's digital governance the government has planned to introduce a new law but before getting into the manner the new law is said to be framed let us know about the it act 2000 and the it rules that is in implementation now only then you can understand it well first is it act of 2000 see the information technology act of 2000 was enacted by the indian parliament in the year 2000 it is the primary law in india for matters related to cyber crime and e governance and know that the act was enacted to give legal sanctions to e-commerce and e-transactions besides this it also enables e-governance and also aims to prevent cyber crime some highlights of the acts are like chapter 2 that deals with uh, the use of digital signature to authenticate an electronic record it also gives legal sanction to digital signatures then chapter 4 of the act gives a scheme for regulation of certifying authority whereas if you take chapter 9 it uh, allows the uh, act to specify penalties and adjudications for various offenses then chapter 10 of the act talks of the establishment of cyber regulation appellate tribunal likewise there is a chapter 11 that deals about various cyber offenses and notifies that the cyber offenses shall be investigated only by a police officer not below the rank of dsp and these offenses including includes tampering with uh, computer source documents publishing of information and crimes related to hacking know that under this law for any crime involving a computer or a network located in india foreign nationals can also be charged and the law prescribes penalties for various cyber crimes and frauds through digital or electronic format now if we take the flaws in the it act first is related to lack of transparency see the section 69a empowers the government to issue directions to intermediaries that means to issue directions to social media platforms for blocking access of information that is considered prejudicial for example if the government feels that uh, the sovereignty and integrity of india or national security or public order gets affected by a content on social media platform then the government can direct the social media intermediary to block that content and know that the section 69a subsection 3 envisages a jail sentence up to six uh, sorry 7 years for uh, intermediaries who fail to comply and in 2009 the government also issued blocking rules 
uh, which sets the procedure for blocking and also stated that all requests and complaints would remain strictly confidential. So the power granted to executives is so vast that the user's content gets blocked even without any due intimation to the user. Then second thing is related to privacy issue. See the IT Act does not address privacy, privacy issues. Uh, we know right privacy is now a fundamental right and the law needs to specifically address privacy concerns but that is not the case here. The third one is regarding the poor protection of cyber security. See the Indian IT Act is not a cyber security law and therefore it does not deal with the nuances of cyber security and the Indian citizens have been uh, victims to numerous instances of uh, data breaches and privacy violations. For example, if we take the instance of Cambridge Analytica incident or the Aadhaar account breach of nearly uh, 1.1 billion citizens are few examples of it. Then fourth is regarding the lack of expertise. See regular police personnel, especially any officer holding the rank of inspector are responsible for investigating these online uh, crime activities. But the difficulty that arises here is that cyber crimes are a nuanced form of criminal activity which requires years of specialized training and deep understanding of technology. So these are the uh, few points regarding the uh, IT Act where there is a flaws uh, that needs to be addressed. Now let us know about the IT Rules 2021 that is mentioned in the article. See the IT Rules 2021 came into force in India to address the social media, digital media, OTT platforms in a specific manner. Know that IT Rules 2021 aims at placing certain obligations on social media intermediaries to ensure an open, safe and trusted internet. Now coming to the features of this rule, first one, the social media companies are prohibited from hosting or publishing any unlawful information. This information is in relation to uh, the interest of the sovereignty and integrity of India, public order, friendly relations, uh, friendly relations with foreign countries, etc. And know that if such unlawful information is hosted or published, then the government can take down such information within 24 hours. Here, the user will be given a notice before his or her content is taken down. Then third thing is about the traceability mechanism. See, the provision requires the social media platform to compulsorily identify the first originator of the information in India. When the government or court order asks the intermediaries to do so, then they have to comply with the order. Fourthly, the IT Rules 2021 calls for social media companies to publish a monthly compliance report. Then, the social media platforms are classified into two categories. One, the social media intermediary that is the platform that have limited use, user base. Second uh, category is the significant social media intermediaries. These are the platforms with a large user base of about 50 lakh users or above. Then the significant social media intermediaries have to follow certain additional measures like these platforms should have a physical contact address in India. And secondly, they have to appoint a chief compliance officer nodal contact officer and a resident grievance officer in India. All of them should be Indian residents. Then uh, the nodal contact person, which I have said now, right, they will do 24 bar 7 coordination with law enforcement agencies, while the resident grievance officer must acknowledge the complaint within 24 hours and resolve the complaint within 15 days of receipt. Now going back to the IT Act of 2000, know that section 79 of the IT Act provides for safe harbor mechanism. See the safe harbor protection to these social media giants makes the intermediary not legally liable for any third party information or data or communication link that is made on their platform. For example, say some X person is publishing a content that is filled with hate and fake news in Facebook. Here the Facebook will not be legally responsible for the publication. And so the government will not prosecute the social media intermediary here. Only the person who made the content will be legally responsible. But here the Facebook has to take down the content once the government orders it to do so. This measure of protecting the social media intermediary from any unlawful post by a third person is what we call safe harbor protection. 
and know that however the intermediary should not involve any way in initiating the transmission of unlawful message or select the receiver of the transmitted message also the social media intermediary should not modify any information of the transmission this means that as long as the platform acts just as a messenger carrying a message from point a to point b it will be safe from any legal prosecution due to transmission of message however it should be without any interference with its content in any manner and finally the article says that while the government has planned to come up with a new law this safe harbor protection might also be reconsidered and here the article also highlights that the union government's uh, minister's statement where he says that although the fundamental right of speech cannot be violated by any platform it is very much important to address the issue of uh, disinformation and fake narratives penetrating through, through these social media platforms and before concluding this topic know that the new law that is titled new digital india act would cover texts such as ai deep fakes and new forms of cyber crime competition issues among internet platforms and data protection and now the government has planned to hold wider consultation with various stakeholders to arrive at the principles of this new law so let us uh, know let us get to know how it moves through various news articles in the future so with this let us end this topic so in this topic we saw about the it act and also about the it rules and the flaws in the it act as a whole so with this let us close this topic and move to the third topic of the day third topic the ideal track to run india's logistic system this news article highlights the issue in india's logistic system and it focuses exclusively on railway network and the way forward in order to improve the freight of goods through railways since this article first mentions about the pm gati shakti national master plan let us know about that in detail see the gati shakti scheme or national master plan for multimodal connectivity plan was launched with the aim of coordinated planning and execution of infrastructure projects this master plan for multimodal connectivity ultimately aims to bring down the logistic costs in india now let us know how gati shakti mission will help in solving india's infrastructure challenges firstly it helps coordination between various ministries see gati shakti platform will connect 16 ministries including roads and highways railways shipping with a view to ensure holistic planning and execution of infrastructure projects secondly it provides data to support land acquisition and environment see the portal will offer nearly 200 layers of geospatial data including geographic information about forest rivers and district boundaries to aid in planning and obtaining clearances thirdly it helps in real time monitoring and resolution of issues see the portal will allow various government departments to track the progress of various projects in real time and at one centralized place so by this way it will also enable fast resolution of issues fourthly it will help in reducing the cost of uh, infrastructure creation by coordinated planning execution and monitoring of infrastructure projects it will result in cost and time savings hence the gati shakti plan will improve the sentiments of banks towards infrastructure lending finally it will improve the quality and reach of multimodal connectivity see pm gati shakti will incorporate various infrastructure schemes like uh, bharat mala sagar mala udan etc hence it will facilitate the last mile connectivity of infrastructure and at the same time reduce travel time and logistic cost so we can say that gati shakti is a step in the right direction but this initiative must be supported by a stable uh, and predictable institutional framework and it has to be implemented efficiently to achieve the desired benefits of the plan for that efficient implementation only the union government has doubled the pm gati shakti uh, fundings to states from rupees 5000 crores to 10000 crores in the budget 2023 to 2024 in addition to it the indian railways is funded with nearly 2.4 lakh crore in the 2023 budget so we can infer that the government is striving to build the logistic infrastructure and is planning for a transformation in economic growth where india is dependent on 
sorry india's logistics is dependent on road railways and other modes of transportation moreover the author highlights the government's target to increase the share of railways in freight movement from 27 percentage to 45 percentage then the government also plans to increase freight movement from 1.2 billion tons to 3.3 billion tons by the year 2030 here the author says that pm gati shakti provides the right platform to address the infrastructural challenges and achieve the targets in the time bound manner after acknowledging the pm gati shakti national master plan and the government's recent fund allocation the author puts some fact forward regarding the railway sector see the majority of freight movement that is nearly 65 percentage of goods in india is moving through road transport so there is an increased dependence of roadways that often leads to traffic congestions pollutions and also increase in logistic cost hence the article highlights that cargo movement through railway can reduce the demand on roadways and at the same time it can reduce the logistic cost in india see various data shows that logistic cost in india are about 13 to 14 percentage of gdp as against 7 to 8 percentage of gdp in developed economies and know that freight movement cost is higher in road sector compared to rail sector but to the contrary the uh, freight movement in railways is getting declined as more industries prefer cargo movement through roads only and other flexible modes of transportation but why this is happening let us see the issues in railway mode of cargo movement firstly let us see the composition of cargo that are moved through railways see coal constitute 44 percentage of total freight movement through railways while the iron ore contributes to 13 percentage cement contributes 10 percentage food grains 5 percentage fertilizers 4 percentage iron and steel 4 percentage these all are said to be bulk goods but the transportation of non bulk commodities accounts for very small share in the rail freight movement this is because non bulk goods are moved through containers only and due to this reason whenever there is a need for the movement of non bulk goods there is an increase in containerized traffic but our country is yet to have railway infrastructure that could cater to such increased containerized traffic here the authors say that all alongside the alongside building building the infrastructure required for logistic sector continuous monitoring of existing projects shall be done to help meet the demand for contained movement alongside this identification of new priority areas will also help in achieving the targets of rail freight movement then the second issue is regarding the infrastructural operational and connectivity challenges see if we take the railway modes of cargo movement there are certain procedures that needs to be followed like getting approval for wagons wagons are nothing but good car- goods carriers then there are loading and unloading operations multimodal handlings etc so because of this there is a procedural delay hence the increased transit time by railways alongside the pre and post movement procedural delays hamper freight movement by railways third factor is the gap in infrastructure see customers who want to move their cargo through railway find a lack of necessary terminal infrastructure then they find there is no maintenance of good sheds and warehouses then uncertain supply of wagons or some of the infrastructural challenges that the customers are facing then finally absence of integrated first and last mile connectivity is said to increase the chances of damage due to multiple handling and increase of inventory holding cost so these are the four points why high net network congestions low service levels and increased transit times are happening in the railway sector now coming to the suggestions part the author takes note of the upcoming dedicated freight corridors along the india's eastern and western corridors and the proposed establishment of multimodal logistic paths in a positive way he says that such infrastructure building can help in increasing the supply capacity of railways and improve the train timings but the author says that adequate policy tools are needed and private participation should be encouraged in the operation and management of terminals uh, containers warehouses to efficiently utilize the resources secondly he pitches for establishing a special entity under the railways to handle intermodal logistics 
here the entity could function as a single window to customers for cargo movement and payment transaction here also he proposes to build a partnership with the private sector to address the first and last mile issue faced by the railways third suggestion is the introduction of uber like model for one of the two cargo wagons that is the author is suggesting for a online booking system for wagons wherein the customers can book the wagons using an online application but the other cargo other cargo wagon can function in a normal way as it is done now until the proposed online booking of wagons becomes successful so these are the few points that are suggested by the author and finally the author concludes by taking note of the integrated logistics infrastructure with last and with first and last mile connectivity by saying that integrated logistics infrastructure is essential to make rail movements competitive with roads and also to facilitate exports by rails to neighboring countries such as nepal and bangladesh so that is all about the topic fourth topic inflation to ease in fiscal year 2024 but the monsoon is a key risk says chief economic advisor see the chief economic advisor v anand nageshwaran attended a seminar on have global headwinds delayed india's march to 5 trillion economy this seminar was organized by the chennai international center and in this speech the chief economic advisor said that the india's inflation rate is expected to ease in the year 2023 to 2024 he also highlighted that the increase in inflation level of developed countries are very much higher and said that although global uncertainty was caused by higher inflation inflation level in india was around 7 percentage which is pretty much lower compared to the developed nations and added that india would likely be a 3.4 trillion dollar economy in the year 2022 to 2023 and india could become a 5 trillion dollar economy either in the fiscal year 26 or in the fiscal year 27 so in this context let us know about the inflation from prelims angle inflation inflation refers to sustained continuous rise in the general price levels of goods and services in an economy over a period of time here we must understand that inflation is rise in prices of basket of goods and services and know that if the price of only one good has gone up for example only there is a price rise of one product it does not constitute inflation now let us know about the effects of inflation see the question one can ask is why somebody should care about inflation what differences does it make if the average level of price changes here we will discuss the effects of inflation on the value of money on lenders and borrowers and on the individuals first is the effect of inflation on the value of money we saw right inflation decreases the value of money over time see money loses value when its purchasing power falls since inflation is a rise in level of prices the amount of goods and services one can buy with a given amount of money falls with inflation as inflation leads to decline in value of money over a period of time it also erodes the purchasing power for example let us suppose a person has rupees 100 in the year 2019 and the price of an apple in the same year is rupees 10 here he or she can buy 10 apples in the year 2019 but now due to inflation the price of apple in the 2020 rises to rupees 20 thus a person who could buy 10 apples in the year 2019 will now be able to buy only 5 apples in the year 2020 thus the purchasing power of money has declined in 2020 over 2019 this is what we say money has lost its value secondly the effect effect of inflation on lenders and borrowers see inflation is bad for lender and good for borrower because inflation helps the borrowers and hurts the lenders that is inflation redistributes wealth from creditor to lenders see lenders suffer due to inflation it is because the money they get paid back has lesser purchasing power than the money they loaned out let us understand this by an example suppose a lender a lends rupees 100 to a person b at 10% interest rate in 2019 the prevailing price of orange in the same year is rupees 10 per orange 
Now in 2020, the prevailing price of orange says rupees 15 per orange due to inflation. Now the B gives money back to A, that is he gives money rupees 110 to person A. Now the person A can buy around 7 oranges. But however, earlier in the year 2019, the person A was able to buy 10 oranges. Thus, money which was paid back to A has less purchasing power than the money loaned out by the person A. Thus, we can say the lender A suffers due to inflation and know that the borrower benefits out of inflation. This is because inflation reduces the value of money and the interest rate that a borrower pays is effectively lower because of inflation. Third, effect of inflation on individuals. See, inflation erodes the value of money, right? So it will hurt people with fixed income. Then people on fixed salaries, fixed pensions will be negatively impacted due to inflation as they will be able to buy lesser. But however, know that business person and uh, the entrepreneurs may benefit from inflation as the price of their final product also rises with inflation. So this is all about inflation from prelims angle. Now let us end this short topic and move to the final topic of the day. Fifth topic, ED arrest Sisodia in Delhi excise policy case. And Sisodia's arrest is a ploy to keep him in jail, says Kejriwal. See, the news article reports the arrest of former Deputy Chief Minister Manish Sisodia on money laundering charges by the Enforcement Directorate. So in this context, let us know about the Enforcement Directorate from prelims angle. See, already there was a news that the tenure of the director of ED was extended three times in a row and even for that, opposition party approached court challenging the government's decision. So, for some time, the enforcement directorate has been in news. So, let us deal with it from prelims angle. See, enforcement directorate is a specialized financial investigation agency and this agency works under the Department of revenue under Ministry of Finance. Know that its headquarters is at New Delhi, which is headed by the Directorate of Enforcement. Now, if we take the history of the Enforcement Directorate, it got originated on the year 1956 as Enforcement Unit in the Department of Economic Affairs. At that time, it was formed for handling exchange control laws. That is, Enforcement Unit dealt with cases that violated Foreign Exchange Regulation Act of 1947. Later in the year 1957, this unit was renamed as Enforcement Directorate. Know that in the year 1960, the administrative control of the Directorate was transferred from the Department of Economic Affairs to the Department of Revenue. And the mandate given to the ED is to enforce provision of two special fiscal laws. They are Foreign Exchange Management Act of 1999 and the Prevention of Money Laundering Act of 2002. Coming to the structure of ED, see the Directorate of Enforcement with its headquarters at New Delhi is headed by the Directorate of Director of Enforcement and in addition to it, there are five regional offices which are located at Mumbai, Chennai, Chandigarh, Kolkata and Delhi. These regional offices are headed by special directors of enforcement and if we take the recruitment, the recruitment of the officers is done directly by drawing officers from other investigation agencies. That is, the personnel from ED comprises officers of IRS, IPS, IAS backgrounds such as income tax officers, excise officers, custom officers and police. Coming to the tenure, in the November month of 2021, the President of India promulgated two ordinances. To, through this ordinance, the center got the power to extend the tenure of directors of CBI and ED from two years to five years. Likewise, the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act of 1946 and the CVC Act of 2003 have been amended. This amendment empowered the government to keep the chief of ED in their post for one year at a time after they have completed their two-year term. Hence, Know that the chiefs of central agencies currently having a fixed period of two-year tenure can now be given three annual extension. So totally, the director of ED can be in office for a period of five years now. Now let us know about the functions of enforcement directorate. See, the ED has the power to carry out 
searches and seizure of property and documents after it had concluded that the money has been laundered. For this, it utilizes the power under section 16 and section 17 of Prevention of Money Laundering Act of 2002. On the basis of that, the authorities decide if the arrest is needed as per the PMLA Act. And know that under section 50 of the PMLA Act, the ED can also directly carry out seizure and search operations without calling the person for questioning. So it is not necessary to summon the person first and then start with the search and seizure. If the person is arrested, the ED gets 60 days to file the charge sheet. And if no one is arrested and only the property is attached, then the prosecution complaint along with attachment order will be submitted before the adjudicating authority within, within 60 days. And if we take the uh, jurisdiction of ED, since both FEMA or PMLA apply to whole of India, the ED can also take action against any person on which this act applies. Know that cases under FEMA may lie in civil court, whereas the PMLA cases will lie in criminal court. Also, the Enforcement Directorate has jurisdiction over a person or any other legal entities who commit a crime. Importantly, all the public servants come under the jurisdiction of the agency if they are involved in any offences related to money laundering. So, corruption in public life will be countered using the ED institution. However, ED cannot take an action which is sumoto. Someone has to go and complain to any other agency or police first and then only ED will investigate the matter and will identify the accused. So these information are enough from prelims angle. So in this news article we saw about ED from prelims angle. So let us close this topic and move to the previous year prelims questions. So today we will be covering two previous year prelims questions which are taken from the year 2022. Let us consider the first question. With reference to the expenditure made by an organization or a company, which of the following statement is or are correct? The first statement says acquiring new technology is a capital expenditure. Second statement, debt financing is considered capital expenditure while equity financing is considered revenue expenditure. Select the correct answer using the code given below. The options given are option A, one only, option B, two only, option C, both one and two, Option D, neither one nor two. See, capital expenditures or funds that are used by the company either to acquire or upgrade physical assets like properties, plans, buildings or technology. So the first statement which says acquiring new technology is a capital expenditure is a correct statement. Now if we consider the second statement, know that debt financing occurs when a company borrows money to be paid back at a future date with interest and it could be either through selling fixed income products like bonds, bills or notes. But however, both the debt financing and equity financing are considered as a part of capital receipts of the company. So this statement is wrong because equity financing is also a capital expenditure only. So the answer for this question is option A, one only. Second question. Consider the following statements. 1. Attorney General of India and Solicitor General of India are, are the only officers of government who are allowed to participate in the meetings of the Parliament of India. Second statement. According to the Constitution of India, the Attorney General of India submits his resignation when the gov government which appoints him resigns. Which of these statements given above is or are correct? The options given are option A, one only. Option B, 2 only. Option C, both 1 and 2. Option D, neither 1 nor 2. See, the first statement is wrong because Article 76 of the Constitution provides for the Office of Attorney General of India and says he is the highest law officer in the country. Then, the Solicitor General of India who assists the Attorney General to fulfill the official duties and responsibilities is not a constitutional post. And... Know that only the Attorney General has the uh, right to participate in the meeting of the Parliament of India. So, Solicitor General of India does not have such powers. So, first statement is wrong. Then if we take the second statement, the term of office of uh, Attorney General is not fixed by the government, by the constitution. And further, the constitution does not contain any procedure 
and grounds for the removal of attorney general so the attorney general holds office during the pleasure of the president only this means the president uh, can remove the attorney general at any time and the attorney general also quits his office by submitting the resignation to president so the constitution does not provide or prescribe any manner uh, when the attorney general has to resign so this statement is also wrong but know that conventionally the attorney general resigns when the government uh, which appoints him resigns or is replaced so the answer for this question is option d neither one nor two now coming to the mains practice question pm gati shakti mission presents a holistic approach to solving india's infrastructure challenges analyze the statement the aspirants can take note of this question you can write it and uh, post it in the comment section for a peer review so with this we have come to the end of the news articles and uh, question discussion so let us wind up the discussion here if you uh, understand the way i am teaching and if you like the video please like it comment and share it with your friends and also subscribe to forum ias in various social media platforms for further updates thank you for listening